Good morning and welcome to worship. This morning we'd like to celebrate with the following who are having birthdays this coming week. Brandon Hacker, Tyler Peterson, Jake Shively, Hannah Meyer, Michaela Leonard, Chris Moe, Thomas Beers, Nathan Bloom, Carrie Schultz, Kyer Halla, and Caden Johnson. The following are celebrating anniversaries this coming week as well. Troy and Darcy Hoyt, Kurt and Val Keeper, Gary and Lois Matson, Jeremy and Tiffany Peters Pearson, Jeff and Sherry Ellison, Jason and April Beyer, Dennis and Sally Anderson, and Chad and Jane Trom. Please join me in congratulating them. As the opportunity arises this week, please wish them the best. Our service begins with a brief order for confession and forgiveness. Would the congregation please stand? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake, forgives us all our sins. By the authority Christ has given to all the baptized, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also let us pray together the prayer of the day. God of abundance, at your table you gather us with all your saints for a foretaste of the heavenly banquet that we will all share when Jesus returns. Send us forth fed and nourished, ready to serve all in need, and invite others to the feast that is you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
days of toil when heart doth fill, God will take care of you. When dangers fears your path assail, God will take care of you. Good morning. I'm going to digress a little today. I got permission from Pastor Julie to do this. Um, if you don't know her that well, she likes to be totally in charge of things, and she likes to know exactly what's coming next. So if you see her hands grasping the chair and turning white, you know this wasn't what she was expecting. Okay. But I guess during my time of being around for a lot of years, what we're going through right now really amazes me. Never ever would I have expected to walk into this church and see a group of people with masks on and no hymns sung. How in the world can you conduct a church service like that? It's just amazing. Totally amazing. So there's going to be a little history to this. Um, this. This catechism here was studied in 1954 from St. Paul's Lutheran Church. There's a gal here today that was, went through every Saturday with me all the way for about four years of education. And this, this catechism book was memorized from front to rear. Not just the, 
the Ten Commandments, what the Office of the Keys, the what does this mean, everything. Almost, I said if there was ever a group of people that had a right to protest, it was the kids that went to St. Paul's Church. Because <laughs> it was totally unfair. I mean, it was just unfair. So I never thought that there'd be a time when I would look back and say, man, I'm glad I did that. But during this time, I, there is one thing that really appealed to me. And <clears throat> it was funny how it got memorized because trying to figure out how to get through to this book in two and a half, three years, I thought, well, I might as well just get, dig into it and get it memorized, get it done with. So I did. And I bet I had three months to go before, and Pastor Max was kind enough to say to me, well, now that you're done with that, there might be a few other things we could memorize. <laughs> oh. And then we started on psalms and hymns and Oh my goodness, it was just totally unfair. But there was one psalm we learned that I'll never forget. And uh, that was the 23rd psalm. And at a time like this, there can't be nothing better than that. And about oh, 20 years ago, I say, I listened to a program called Enlightened on satellite radio. And there was a story about a pastor that was retiring and he had the habit of giving this 23rd Psalm, a recitation of it between Christmas and uh, Thanksgiving. And he was about to retire and oh, one lady asked him, could you let one last time recite this for us? And he never gave a commentary afterwards, but this time he did. So he recited the psalm, and it was always very, very slowly. Because if you're really going to digest this psalm, you have to go at it verse by verse, not in a paragraph form, but in a verse form. And it would go something like, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. He'll make me to lie down in green pastures. He'll lead me beside the still waters. He'll restore my soul. He'll lead me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, his rod and his staff will comfort me. He'll prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He'll anoint my head with oil and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And after he was done, <clears throat> he said, I wonder how many of these verses are really near and dear to you. Because the whole real message might be not listed in that psalm. The message might be what David was when he was young. He was a shepherd and he'd sat and took care of sheep. He knew what it was to be a shepherd. And probably all of his neighbors, that's what they did. They watched the sheep. But there was one thing in common that every sheep herd and shepherd had. And that was the sheep knew the voice of the shepherd. And if you think about that a little, you have to think, do I know that voice? Because if I don't, I won't know where to go. 
And if he calls, I know who's gonna take me to another pasture, because the sheep would just sit there and eat it down to nothing. So he'd move them from week to week, and they'd go by the water and they'd rest. So the whole psalm kind of has a meaning to it that if you know his voice and you listen, some mighty good things can happen. So, now we'll get to what I'm supposed to be at, okay? <clears throat> First reading is Isaiah 55, 1 through 5. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Here ends the reading. Please read in unison Psalm 136, 1 through 9, as found on the screen. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. For his steadfast love endures forever. Who made the great lights? For his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day. For his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night. For his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our whole estate. For his steadfast love endures forever and he rescued us from our foes. For his steadfast love endures forever, who gives food to all the flesh. For his steadfast love endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. The second reading is from Romans 9, 1 through 13. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all. God blessed him forever. Amen. It is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all Israelites truly belong to Israel, and not all of Abraham's children are his true descendants. But it is through Isaac, that descendants shall be named for you. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise are countless as descendants. For this is what the promise said. About this time I will return and Sarah shall have a son. Nor is that all. 
Something similar happened to Rebecca when she conceived children by one husband and our ancestor Isaac. Even before they had been born or had done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose of election might continue, not by the works, but by his call, she was told. The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. Here ends the reading. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the, the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. Today's gospel reading begins with these words, after he had heard this. But what had he heard? What was it that drove Jesus out to a deserted place to be alone? It was the bad news about his friend, his cousin, his forerunner, John the Baptist. Jesus had just been told that John had been killed at the hands of King Herod. John, who had prepared the way for Jesus, who had baptized him, who ceaselessly pointed to him as the one that they'd all been waiting for, had become victim to the manipulation and cunning of a queen who thought she should be above the law. Herod's wife had violated the law by marrying her husband's brother. Now, her husband was an important political figure, but not as important as his brother, the king. So she made a calculation and traded one brother for another in violation of the law. John the Baptist had been quick and relentless in pointing out this grievous sin. He'd called the king and his wife to repentance just as he called all sinners to repentance. But the queen didn't think someone like John had any business speaking the truth about her adulterous relationship. John had embarrassed her by saying out loud what everyone in the kingdom was probably thinking. Herod's wife was a social climber at best who had traded up by marrying the king, and in doing so, Herod and his wife had broken the law. There was simply no denying it. But none of us like to really admit it when we've broken the law. Our first instinct is to deny. So I think our sp my speedometer must be off a little bit. Or maybe that really was a legitimate tax deduction or maybe we really had a right to the extra items that the clerk didn't charge us for. Or it's not my fault if some unknown person was just being careless by leaving their iPhone laying around where I happened to find it. 
We're quite gifted at denying our violations of the law, at justifying ourselves. And none of us really like to have those violations thrown in our faces and certainly not aired in public. But John aired the king's violations in public, and his reward was a violent death, an unjust death brought about by the king's foolishness and his wife's cleverness. The king had made a foolish promise in order to impress his guests and kind of creepily impress his wife's daughter, also known as his niece. And if he broke that promise, well, that would be all that his guests remembered of that day. So John lost his head, and they had something else to remember. This is the story that Jesus had just heard when our reading begins. And hearing that moved Jesus to want to be alone for a while. He withdrew from the crowds that had begun to follow him wherever he went. He went in search of a place where he could be alone and sort through the story he had just heard. Without the demands of this crowd that needed him so desperately and so relentlessly. But this crowd was desperate and relentless and not so easily escaped. They followed him, going out into this remote place, desperately needing what only he could provide. And rather than being annoyed with them or seeking to find a better hiding place, Jesus had compassion on these followers. Mark's gospel tells us he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He recognized their need. He recognized how lost they were, and he healed those who were sick and spoke his word of hope to those in despair. But then it got to be supper time, and the disciples started to have some concerns. Here's Jesus off in a remote place, not near any grocery stores or restaurants, no farmers markets or Sam's clubs, with a huge crowd of people waiting for every word that comes from his lips. But the disciples were getting hungry. And they probably figured this crowd was getting hungry as well. Now, in antiquity, showing hospitality to guests was crucially important to a person's social standing. Hosts took kind of extreme measures to give their guests a positive experience. Remember, Herod had just performed an execution for the sake of his guests. So as the disciples saw the sun sinking on the horizon, they must have recognized that some social obligations were about to set in, obligations that they had absolutely no capacity to fulfill. If Jesus kept preaching to these people right up until supper time, well, someone had to feed them. And the disciples didn't have enough food for these people. Jesus certainly didn't have enough food for these people. There was no reason to think that this crowd had all packed a lunch when they spontaneously followed Jesus out there into the boondocks. So they needed to send these people away. That way the crowd could be responsible for their own meal, and the disciples could figure out where they were going to go for theirs. But Jesus wouldn't send them away. He wouldn't disperse this crowd, the very same crowd he had just tried to escape. He was determined to stay with them until all who needed it were healed. All who were hungry were fed. All who were thirsty had drunk from the water of life. But how was that supposed to happen when they had nothing there but five loaves and two fish? How was this multitude supposed to be fed when that was all they had on hand? It simply wasn't enough. And perhaps we can relate to these disciples a bit at this point. We know what it's like to feel like all that we've got are five loaves and two fish, and that's not nearly enough. All we've got is what's coming in the next paycheck. All we've got is what we've scrimped and saved. All we've got is our personal strength. All we've got is our ingenuity. 
All we've got is our resourcefulness. All we've got is our common sense. All we've got is what we've spent a lifetime amassing. And it's not nearly enough. It could all be gone in the blink of an eye. All we've got is five loaves and two fish. We're not prepared for a crowd. We're not prepared for a catastrophe. And that's where the disciples miss the boat, and we usually do as well. Because, of course, that wasn't all they had. And what's listed on our personal balance sheets is not all that we have either. We can't forget that God in the flesh is standing right there. And he came into the world for the sole purpose of bringing the bread of life to a starving people, a starving world. One crowd wasn't more than he could handle, so Jesus took those five loaves and those two fish, and with them he fed the multitude until everyone was full and there was quite a bit left over. He would not send anyone away hungry. Jesus created a feast where there had been hunger. He created abundance where there had been want. And everyone went home full that night. You're not facing the crowds, the catastrophes of your life all on your own with whatever meager supplies you've managed to scrape together, whatever clever ideas you can come up with. The Lord has made a promise to you to be your Lord, to be your Savior. And with that comes his promise to provide you with food and clothing, home and family, daily work, and all you need from day to day, to protect you in times of danger and guard you from every evil. He has promised to never send you away hungry. And he feeds you not only with loaves and fish, he gives you his very self in the feast that we're about to share. That bit of bread and that sip of wine that's a foretaste of the feast that's coming. The everlasting feast in his everlasting kingdom where there is always more than enough. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Would the congregation please stand? Now let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O Lord, I cry to you for help. <clears throat> Give me the joy of your saving help again. Let my mouth be full of your praise. Every day will I bless you. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He redeems my life from the grave. Lord, hear my prayer. This time I invite you to remove the cover from the communion elements in front of you. And for those at home, you are welcome to join along in the words of institution or uh, designate someone in your household to preside. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. 
Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son that you have kept us this night from all harm and danger. We pray that you would keep us this day also from sin and every evil, that all our doings and life may please you. Into your hands we commend our bodies and souls and all that is ours. Let your holy angels have charge of us, that the wicked one have no power over us. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated and the ushers will dismiss you from the back.